Okay. So, David James Poisson, known as Jamie by uh, his friends and, and loved ones, is the author of the novel Lake Life, by, uh, published by Simon Schuster, a New York Times editor's choice selection, and the Heaven of Animals stories, a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and the, the Penn Bingham Prize. He teaches at the MFA program at the University of Central Florida. And I will unmute Jamie and spotlight the video. Okay, uh, Jamie, you're on. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? If you can hear me, just give me a thumbs up. Yes, good, awesome, thank you. This is great, this is like a fun Cincinnati reunion. I haven't seen Kate or Ian or Michael or Alan in years. <laughs> um, but I miss you. I, well, I also just miss people. We've been pretty quarantined. <laughs> We've been very serious about, about it. So it's any chance to, um, to have community, however virtually, is really appreciated. Um, so I'm just going to read a very short chapter from the novel. This is chapter four. Um, I'm reading chapter four because any of the first six chapters can kind of be the uh, first chapter. Um, the, the novel is told from six points of view, and this is Diane's point of view. Um, the novel begins with a family reconvening for a long weekend at a lake. Uh, the lake is called Lake Christopher. It's loosely based on Lake Toxaway in North Carolina. Um, and the family stays at their double wide trailer there every summer. Uh, the house is being sold and the sons aren't too happy about this. And their eldest son, Michael, who is an alcoholic, um, he has suffered a head injury trying to save the life of a child who was drowning in the lake. Um, he was not successful to drown. And this chapter picks up from his wife, Diane's point of view, and they are uh, on their way to the hospital. So they're in the ambulance, and this is Diane, and it's kind of one of the more stream of conscious chapters. It's chapter four. Diane Maddox exhales. Diane Maddox, who traded Tennessee for Texas. Diane Maddox, whose parents are divorced. Diane Maddox, who married Michael 10 years ago and wouldn't take her husband's name. Diane Maddox, who carries a child inside of her. Diane Maddox, who had an abortion in high school and who does not regret that choice, but who is not in favor of making that choice a second time. Diane Maddox, who went to school to be a painter before settling for being an art teacher. Diane Maddox, who wonders whether 33 is too early for a midlife crisis, were women said to have those, and if those meant more than a red motorcycle and the affair to go with it. Diane Maddox, who has been reassessing her infinitesimal place in the cruel and sideways pressing world. Diane Maddox, who likes dangly earrings. Diane Maddox, who has always longed to visit Reykjavik. Diane Maddox, who grew up watching Mad About You and wanted to be Helen Hunt. Diane Maddox, who in eighth grade cried through the Mad About You finale, cried over the fact that Paul and Jamie weren't together anymore. They would give it another try, the way Diane's parents gave it another try too many times to count, giving it another try, code for the pain a daughter feels when some mornings dad is there eating Cheerios and some mornings mom says, I hope that fucker drives that thing off a fucking bridge. Diane Maddox, who is unhappy, but for whom divorce does not feel like an option, whether to prove something to her parents or to mad about you, she isn't sure. Diane Maddox, who wonders whether things would have gone better had she taken her husband's name, though, of course, a name can't save you. A name can't save a marriage, can't save a house from sale or a boy from the bottom of a lake. Diane in the ambulance. Diane not crying, keeping calm. Diane following the paramedic's instructions as the ambulance navigates country roads and the paramedic measures Michael's blood pressure. Diane Maddox not starling, and it's never too late to change a thing, except sometimes it is pressing the damp cloth to the head of the man she loves or loved some days. Let's face it, she's not sure. Blood pooling beneath the cloth, the forehead, an awfully vascular area, the paramedic says, worse than it looks, which Diane takes to mean looks worse than it is, though she can't be sure of this. There will be stitches, though she hopes against concussion, against brain injury, against anything permanent, because in all fairness can the girl who said in sickness and in health still speak for Diane at 33? 
Say Michael slips into a coma or spends his life in diapers drinking through a straw. Does the Diane who said, I do love this man enough to wipe his ass another 50 years? And how to love a man who's made it clear, if not in words, then in scowls and sighs, in the way he picks strings from the frayed cuffs of his jeans that he'd rather her not have the child. Does she love Michael enough to stay? Does she love herself enough to leave? She doesn't know, knows only that Michael's blood is real and warm and won't stop rising from his head. The ambulance breaks, the doors open, and she breathes. The hospital is not what she was expecting. Small and beige, the building looks less like a hospital than a bank someone dropped onto an acre in the woods. Gently, Diane is pushed aside by a nurse at the curb, Michael lowered into a wheelchair and asked to hold the cloth to his own head. Of all the fears she's ever known, fear of flying, of snakes, of seeing the sticks minus sign become a plus, never has she known a fear like watching her husband's face paint the water red. The paramedic pushes the wheelchair forward. The nurse holds the door open for Michael to be pushed through and Diane follows. Inside the waiting room is empty, the floor a checkerboard. The woman at the front desk is rude, the hallways are hot, the x-ray room is cold. And Michael is on a table and she's at his side. The betadine goes on and Michael winces, his forehead orange. The needles go in and she has to look away. She holds his hand. The next time she looks, eight Frankensteinian stitches hold his head together. They fill the gap between eyebrow and hairline as though Michael's left eyebrow has an eyebrow of its own. Then the x-rays are in and all is well, good enough for this country doctor anyway, though Michael gives Diane a look that says, when we get home, we're getting a second opinion. Not that they can afford a second opinion. What with a mortgage they can hardly handle on a house worth half what they paid in 2007, four maxed out credit cards plus Diane's student loans, which no matter how hard she ignores them, aren't exactly going anywhere. Still, she's glad to see him talking, smiling. Mostly, she's happy she won't have to change his diapers till death do them part. That says there is a diaper she wouldn't mind changing in seven months. This thing, this love for a thing unborn, a thing that isn't even yet a thing. How to explain this love to her husband? She promised him she wouldn't want a child, and she'd meant it at the time. The mistake wasn't getting pregnant. The mistake was making a promise that was never hers to keep. The doctor shrubs his hands. A nurse will be with them shortly to discuss care and cleaning, he says, then dries his hands and leaves. Michael's still on the table, lying down. His eyes are on her middle, as though he can see beyond her waist into the womb. We're keeping it, she wants to say, but doesn't. Not yet. She's not religious, but she is superstitious, and it seems bad luck to fight about the pregnancy today, as though... Doing so might invite the spirit of the dead boy into her, might curse her with a baby born blue-lipped without breath. If fates are steered by thoughts or words, the least Diane can do today is keep quiet. So she lets him hold her hand. She smiles. And there are many, many things she does not say. Thank you. Very good. Oh, so good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep reading. Uh, yeah. So um, we'll have time for we'll we'll do some questions and stuff after uh, Kate reads. But um, let's see. Let me go back to spotlight myself, and then I'm gonna read Kate Pollock's bio. Kate Pollock is a professor and writer. Her work is forthcoming, or has recently appeared. In plain songs with Sweeney's, so to speak, uh, Barzak, and elsewhere. She lives in Yellow Springs with her husband and five familiars, uh, very cute familiars, and has painted her house to resemble a jack o' lantern. Now, I have not seen that, but I'm sure that's true. Uh, 
So, <laughs> oh, oh, I unmuted you and then I unmuted you back. Okay, there. Uh, all right, so Kate, go ahead and take a. Oh, you just muted yourself. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to have this like little like, kind of Cincinnati reunion. Uh, it's much like Jamie, like I've really missed seeing folks and, you know, I mean, you get a little of that on social media, but you don't really get the, uh, the kind of sensation of that community around you, which is something that I've really missed since grad school. Uh, at Wittenberg, I, I, you know, I had a community just at the very end because uh, when I was first there until like two years ago, it was just old professors. Uh, and uh, I was kind of like, yes, I am, I am not that rickety uh, yet. I mean, it'll happen. It'll happen to all of us. Uh, so I chose a bunch of different stuff and I'm going to occasionally ask for input. Uh, uh, but I'd like to start off with uh, We Wake to Empire because uh, that one's always a good spooky one to uh, start off with. So uh, this is after Marilyn, Ch Marilyn Chin's October song. I watch horror shows to evade encroaching dread. I poke ghosts and make goblins manifest. We're only gore and rhythmic history yawning in spite, smoothing our bad brother's hair, lest we be what we thought we are and feared. A jest of devolution, family, the chance, what am I to him, an obvious crime. Our breasts are like our fears, monsters, poverty, children, shut doors. We're nothing to our neurons, unnerved hurt. It's why we don't survive our fright. Don't live beyond flesh fence that makes us scare. We work because even brave, we want enough to give. To be loved is to be the meat flensed from deer. To be haunted is to smell winter coming near. And uh, that's, uh, that's one uh, that uh, recently got picked up and I'm gonna follow it with another kind of more tragic one and then move to a couple of lighter ones uh, and so on. Uh, but this is The Daily Tragedy, which uh, got published by Plain Songs and, uh, uh, and is, uh, is one of the ones that I, uh, that I find most important. Uh, this was coming out of the Me Too movement, and uh, so it's called The Daily Tragedy for Anita Hill, Christine Blasey Ford, and the rest of us. It is a hill. The climb is steep. You slip where no one wants to catch you. You are the hill. You are a crest that's through its topography meant to be conquered. You are a metaphor. It is a river. It must be crossed, but to ford it, you lose something. Your shoe, your name, the sense stories give you that all will write in the end. You will be a cross, which makes the fording worth it. You don't yet know how the wilderness works. There is no top or base, no end across the water. The river is better likening, only shadden upstream. Unknowingly, you wade into the clear water, but it sticks to you, it sticks. And uh, to take a uh, hard turn, uh, this one is called Goddamn Chickens and is about the chickens that uh, it have been uh, plaguing and delighting my yard for a while. Without much thought, I began flinging seed to a neighbor's flock when sitting near dusk. They'd be let out, scattering through the block yards to root among beds. See beginning stars before returning to roost. Charmed, I threw to them whatever was on hand, and proving too faithful, they came back. Ungainly forms, surprisingly swift and full tilt. The swarm now boils across the street, their waddle its own momentum, bizarre proof against entropy. The striped one is most forward, pecking my foot to insist on her treats. 
I love how she owns me, making her needs more than the shell I see, that she's hungry like me and a person too. And uh, then I want to get uh, advice from the audience uh, on, would you prefer uh, drunk history cider or would you prefer two winemakers on a Zoom tasting inadvertently describe my hottest teenage sexual experience? <laughs> I mean, obviously both. That's what I wrote as well. Okay, we'll go for both. <laughs> so I'm going to start with drunk history cider because that's the more mythic one, and then the other one is uh, like straight up rearranged quotes from a Zoom a Zoom wine tasting that just worked well. <clears throat> so drunk history cider. Uh, three quarters placed along the counter by the back door. They're not for any sanctioned use, but they're neat fit into the notch at the top of the flask that lends us levity, more plain, it's air that makes the cider light. Spin down pressure, release the valve, the scent compressed orchard from 300 years drunk on fruit. Scions of our nation's mythic trees. When did the fall become teeth sunk into an apple? Soon as fermentation was a thing, Wild hogs that ran amok through villages, blotto kids who wasted were risking less danger than the stream posed, Johnny wandering with bags of seed to spread his gospel to the land. The cooler climes, bittersweet fecundity and fallow spells produced the northern spy, Liberty Winesap, Wick, uh, Wixen and Davenay. Heirloom, a woven legacy, a tool, its ritual, each fall, we pose our jugs below the spout that directs the juice from press to tumult, from distillation to mouth, from throat to brain, where once again, we reckon with our heritage and our remains. And I always just love that one because I've been making a uh, cider with uh, one of my neighbors every fall and we go up the road to the, uh, uh, to the orchard and uh, fill these massive five gallon jugs with cider and then both of us are not to be trusted like literally the, so you wait three weeks after you do all the stuff to it uh, and then we always drink like a gallon or two like the first day uh, and we cannot be fucking trusted with this stuff it's it's so good uh, and so like that's why we still have a cider keg on our back porch because you know uh, why not make a few more batches? And then this is uh, two winemakers on a Facebook live tasting accidentally describe my hottest teenage romance. Uh, and once again, these are all things that these winemakers actually said. Uh, all of this direct quotes rearranged into uh, meter. <clears throat> well, the same species. They manifest differently. Some have looser clusters, some more stamina. It may take a little time to come out of its shell, but it's a testament to understanding the fruit. 18, it got very wet, very dicey at the end. Try to slow down the vine, breaking vigor is key. The progression of little more skin contact builds to a deeper, more complex flavor. When managed correctly and done in moderation, it's a game changer. It's that wet forest floor taste. The fruit is just radiating. Sorry, I lost myself there for a minute. Without the weight, it wouldn't have this tenacity, this length on the palate. Be adventurous, be experimental, and share with us. <laughs> and, you know, Ian and I had signed up for this, like, wine tasting, and, like, we got the wine sent to us, and we had no idea what a fucking delight we were in for. <laughs> 
we're both we're both sitting there and we keep turning off the uh, the camera because we can't stop laughing at these two men who are very earnestly and you know honestly without like any expression in their voices like uh, uh, desperately attempting to like convey their love of wine and are just turning it into the most perverted thing ever and i just adored it i have a much longer list of things that they said but those were the things that kind of fit with the form that i was trying to work with <laughs> uh <clears throat> but uh so I want to do two paired poems uh, quickly that both deal with uh, <clears throat> elements of uh, COVID-19 as well as uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, which are the kind of two major polls that I think we've all been working with and kind of operating under. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to start with uh, lung conditions and then move to the other one. And you'll see kind of why I want to pair them. So lung conditions. My husband's breath doesn't come easy now because at the time it didn't come at all. It stalled and gouges that his blood's pall left his love notes empty space. He lived free from breathing three days until dirty, scared, and sweating, reeking of wood smoke from a hitch, he found a doctor who could tell him that which he didn't already know. He couldn't breathe. And of course, they brought him back to life. They cut, they stuck tubes in his lungs, plunged them in a bucket. They made a constellation on his chest to make him take another gasp to make him shut that waiting window where the soul flies when done with some dull paltry work it's laden with the glass descending escape gone the path from here coiling out darkened in shades drawn against the light at night his fugitive sigh soothes me to sleep but i know he's not the only one who can't always breathe And then this follows to the other one, which is in commemoration of uh, someone who recently died of uh, COVID-19. This is called Flowers from Franz Fanon for Herman Cain. You died of wearing a mask. You died attired in nothing but what God gave you, a face Hopeful as grace, muted umber, a place to tuck away those dreams of being more. People are fed up, you said, and that's true. We've been fed things that are no good for us. We've been fed things we shouldn't have to swallow. What we've been fed shouldn't be food. It's not just 999 empowerment zones or the like. It's that to be who you were, you had to be other than who you were. You had to drink tea to wear the mask, not the one you put across your mouth and nose, the other one, the one you slide into without knowing what you've become. And I'm gonna end uh, on uh, a very short one. Uh, and this is called Talking with Mom on the Phone During Quarantine. She told me, stay boring. And I said, I hope nothing happens tomorrow. <laughs> wow well thank you very much for both of our readers um i have the uh settings to so you can unmute yourself now if you want to as you want to um and uh before we jump into questions and such i just want to throw out a quick shout out to our next reading which is next thursday and it's going to have Michael Rerick, who's here with us today. Yay! And um, it's also going to have James, oh goodness. Brubaker? Brubaker. I'm blanking on his last name for a second. I got James you. Brubaker. So That's if you've never read James Brubaker, you're in for a treat. Um, and uh, if you've never read Michael Rerick, you're in for a treat. And uh, they'll both be here. And, and I think most of you know Michael. Uh, and. Uh, if you don't, hey, Michael, say hi. Um, if, uh, anyway, 
so now what about the questions for our authors? Uh, real quick, just uh, Michael's, uh, so uh, Michael's reading it uh, on Thursday next week? Yep. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. Same on the time, third, though. September 3rd. Perfect. I was just Day after Alan's birthday. <laughs> uh, whatever, just throwing that out there. Insider <laughs> info, if you come to readings and everything. But, yeah. Well, I just want to thank you both again. Wonderful work, really mm -hmm. great performances in reading your work. Um, and I don't have any questions right now, um, but I just want to say how exciting it was to hear you. Maybe someone can think of their questions while we're... Oh, oh also, while people yes. are thinking of their questions, uh, if you haven't already, turn on the group chat. Uh, oh, yeah. Christy has posted some uh, links in the book uh, uh, for books in the chat, and so you can go there and, and find the books for our readers. So exciting stuff. Very briefly, I hate to disappoint, but <clears throat> mine is just scholarship. It's not poetry. <clears throat> I, have a, I have a selection uh, that I've uh, put together, and now I'm the process of, you know, Everyone who's been through that process, like the constant sending out, yay, Michael has it. Uh, yes. But, uh, but the, the poetry is very different from the scholarship. And, uh, uh, and I would appreciate it if uh, anyone would buy the scholarship, of course. But, <clears throat> but I know that's uh, sometimes a bigger ask than the creative writing because, uh, you know, it, it requires you to do things that some weekends you would rather not. But scholarship about cool things. Also, I think this is the right group for scholarship, but uh, not the stuffy kind of scholarship people associate with, with that word. It's like really insightful and about fun texts that are nice to read. It's a great book, Kate. Thank you. Uh, honestly, I had a lot of fun writing it. I mean, it was, it, it was one of those uh, <clears throat> labors of love that, uh, uh, you know, I, I had my dissertation, then I entirely rewrote it after my dissertation. And uh, then, uh, and I had already rewritten several chapters in the process of the dissertation, then, uh, you know, the entire kind of editing process and so on. It was actually really enjoyable because it helped me uh, really think through some things and hone in on some things in a different way. And that was that was really enriching. I mean, it, uh, I would highly recommend uh, writing a monograph if you can try to fit that into your schedule because it makes, it crystallizes your intellectual projects for you in a way nothing else does. I think that's what I was very impressed with, uh, the cohesiveness of it as a whole. That was already kind of my problem with my critical work is it, it never kind of went all together, you know? So I, I was very impressed with how it all I was like, shit, this is great, you know. That was the, that was the rewriting entirely, though. I mean, uh, I I really didn't know what I was doing until I wrote the final chapter of my dissertation, which ironically was based on the first paper that I'd done in grad school on a comic. Uh, it bore no relationship to that original paper, but. Uh, but it was uh, it was all this kind of like obsessive rewriting that uh, I really didn't do until graduate school because in undergrad I was like I'm gonna get an A anyways whatever fuck y'all uh, and uh, and that helped me uh, helped me realize like oh these are th these are the actual things that I'm interested in and uh, and that was that was real fun. Uh, uh, I wish I could convince my students of that, but it's never going to happen. And, and you know, I can't blame them. I was also 18. Was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube later, that's Ethics in the Gutter, Empathy in Historical Fiction and Comics. So even comics and cartoons. I think it's Empathy in the Gutter. What I say? No, it's Ethics in the Gutter. Yeah. Oh, ethics. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yeah, hey, <laughs> and that's by Kate Pollock, and then um, Lake Life by Jamie, uh, Jamie Croissant, and uh, also Heaven of Animals. Yeah, there's the cover. Yeah. I love the cover, Jamie. Really oh, thank you. Yeah, 
just beautiful. I like the cover of both of these books. But Thanks. Oh, yeah. I got so lucky. I, I can't take any credit for the covers, but um, for the second book, SNS went out of their way. And um, uh, Rodrigo Corral, who designed the cover, he's also done some, some iconic covers. Like uh, he did the Fault in Our Stars cover and um, the Million Little Pieces cover, which, you know, it's not a great wow. book, but everyone knows that the hand covered in sprinkles. So just, he's, he's just great at covers. <laughs> he's an amazing designer. Well, and, you know, little did we know about a million little pieces, but like, yeah, that is a beautiful, iconic yeah, cover. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and yeah, I was just excited to hear some of it because I haven't gotten a chance to read it. It's kind of on my docket for uh, <laughs> the end of, uh, uh, no, for the end of this semester. That's, uh, that's one of my kind of, uh, it, that's on my book to-do list. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, there will not be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I, you oh, it's the worst part of teaching, isn't it? Yes, I yeah. hate assessment. <laughs> yeah, can't we just read and geek out together? <laughs> uh, Actually, I did have a. This is why you uh, need to be librarians. I don't have to grade. Anna shit. is the librarian. We have a librarian with us. We have so. two librarians. And then uh, John is also a librarian. Oh yeah, John. Um, uh, <laughs> have a question. I think someone yeah I think John to... I think John was asking that question oh no it was Michael, Michael were you asking something oh uh yeah I just from the uh, the reading uh, Jamie uh, from that chapter I thought it was really interesting and I it seemed co a conscious choice but it, I guess this is more of an observation and maybe you can just sort of respond um, the way you use like sort of the, the that notion of the power of the name, like if you name something, it, it, you imbue it with power. And so there's sort of that repetition of of her name uh, and, and then the Michael and uh, also the sort of these little threads of conversation or uh, little threads of how naming can be impotent or not, you know, it kind of comes up like and then it sort of ends with what isn't said. Um, but I also noticed at the end, uh, towards the end of it, just pronouns are mostly being used rather than proper names. I, I don't know, it's just it, really interesting with the way that chapter uses proper nouns a lot, but then it diminishes, and also the way that that, that works with description. It seems to kind of also oscillate from sort of the more general to the more specific. Uh, and I thought that was just sort of an interesting uh, progression through that particular chapter. Oh, I don't thank know. you. It was cool. No, th yeah. thank you for noticing the little stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I yeah. So it definitely, absolutely begins with her thinking her in her full name. But then it moves to Diane. Then it moves to just she. Um, right. And I, you know, I, I I can't say exactly what what I was going for there, but um, yeah, I mean, she's very much a character who has has spent her life um, since moving out of her parents' house. Uh, kind of asserting her independence only to realize how much she really has given up for her husband um, and then needing to decide you know how her life is going to look from here on out and and you know to, just the fact that she didn't take his name doesn't mean she's not really still under his thumb in a lot of ways so like a, a little bit of irony with that as well that's interesting yeah 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 the way the names are cool that's cool yeah i thought it was i thought it worked really it was just really interesting the way those all of those things were kind of playing off of each other oh thanks thanks so much and i, I just yeah. oh sorry no go ahead yeah. oh i just wanted to uh, pick up from what michael was talking about I, I i felt like it was this interesting formal way of estranging the self from the character and uh, uh, where the the pronouns no longer kind of uh, uh, no longer represent her as as it goes along and that was just cool yeah so well thank you I, I just I just realized Matt is here Jessica is Matt McBride <laughs> it's good to see you Matt <laughs> you look so different you look great <laughs> <laughs> so what other questions do you have anything i'm curious have you, have you and ian been to a wine tasting that wasn't over zoom and did you find it equally insufferable <laughs> well so so 
Okay, very long story made very short. Uh, the, we, we had started dating in the summer of uh, 2010. Yeah, 2010, it's been 10 years. Uh, and uh, about two weeks after we started dating, uh, he was like, well, I'm going up to this like hippie grassroots festival, like, and uh, I'll miss you for the week that I'm gone. And I was like, whatever, I can go, I'm not doing anything. Uh, and so I was insane and kind of like went off into the woods with like him and uh, several of his friends, like hoping that nothing was going to happen that was bad. And like long story short, it didn't. But uh, uh, but he also took me on wine tastings kind of like away from this like weird hippie music festival that we were at. And uh, we got addicted to kind of like going to the Finger Lakes region. So like every year we go up to the Finger Lakes region, which is the cheapest wine tastings you can do, but they're still really good. Like a lot of the places are really doing wonderful wine. Like some of them are just doing the like horrible sweet wine that, you know, buses pull up and like a bunch of drunk women stumble out and get drunker. But that's, uh, 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 there are still a lot of like good boutique winemakers and there are people who are interested in the uh, in the wine, and some of them are insufferable, but uh, uh, most of them are interesting. And like the the wine tasting rooms are really beautiful, and they kind of overlook the lakes and stuff. And uh, and it's a nice little thing. So we go like camping, and then we're like wine tasting during the day. So it's like a combination of like rustic and hoity-toity that's really satisfying for both of us. Uh, but like we we've done a few Zoom wine tastings and all of them have been in like way insufferable in ways that like in person wine tastings are not. Uh, but this one was the only one where I was like, like I'm I'm not sure that I'm old enough to watch this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and. and and uh, and so that was that was kind of the thing that uh, that spurred the poem because like most of them are just like oh our terroir and blah 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 and like you'll taste a lot of slate in this one it's like no one knows what that means like and, uh, and you're just like oh this wine's delicious interesting uh, we also did a beer and cheese pairing tasting via Zoom. And that was not only not perverted, but also much more dynamic. Uh, the brewers are a more dynamic presentation group than the wine people, uh, which is unfortunate because like, I, I have a lot more love for wine than I do for beer, but maybe it's the cheese people. Like the cheese, it, I mean, cheese people are super enthusiastic. What I think I, I loved most about, I can't remember if you used the word in the poem or after, but your use of the word earnestness because I, I love seeing earnestness and passion in people, but there's nothing harder to keep a straight face to than someone else's earnestness if you're just not in the mood for it. Like, if you can't get on board, their earnestness is only hilarious. For, for this one, it was the earnestness combined with the utter lack of self-awareness about how, uh, like, sexual everything sounded. I mean, it's just, and I mean, there was, there was, there were no cracking of smiles. There was no like side glance or anything. It was like two guys standing there talking about wine like this. And those were the lines they came up with. <clears throat> and I, it, I'm, I, I'm never going to entirely recapture that experience. I wish I'd recorded it instead of just like typing down every single thing they said on my phone. Uh, but it was simultaneously earnest and eerie in its lack of uh, its lack of emotion. I mean, it was it was emotional. They were excited about it, but like it was a very flat affect in terms of delivery. And uh, then there was this like subsequent layer of like references that I I don't trust them to have understood, in spite of the fact that they were like both. Their forties. I mean, they were not out of the realm of people who would not get the joke. Uh, if they had been seventy, I would have been much less likely to mock them. But they were like they were guys in like roughly my kind of age cohort, and I was like, no, like I I remember high school, and so do you. Uh, <laughs> they've been using these terms so often and so indiscriminately, they've lost that connotation. But it does kind of remind me of 
uh, when we were in grad school and there would be like a word that we would like try to repeat over and over just to see, you know, who would crack up or who would, you know, mess it up first. Do you, you remember Jesse Cornelson's uh -huh. uh, Hegemony Cricket and Shaka Lacan? <laughs> think of those constantly like every time I teach Lacan in any context I cannot not think to myself Shaka Lacan and like have to work not to say it and then every time every time I've ever said hegemony like earnestly uh once again uh I can't not think hegemony cricket <laughs> and, and I just I just wish she would make the comics of those like the, like I can't do it. Like it, it, she's she's got the turn of mind for that. <laughs> as as an undergrad, to my professor's eternal disappointment, we were I was in a sci-fi lit class, and we were studying the work of Philip K. Dick, and we all got the giggles so bad that he had to start talking about the author and just calling him Philip. <laughs> it was, I don't know what it was that day, but we could not handle it. Uh, that's a lot of Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta work with your room too oh, oh my god uh, i mean just go with the author <laughs> yeah there's there's a great uh poem the the the, the wine tasting zoom wine tasting reminded me of uh, there's a telia field poem in one of her books that's about she basically collected uh this chat thread that went on and on and on. Like her poem is super long. And so she just gathered for, you know, how much of it uh, that she did. But uh, it's about how to uh, get rid of ants. And so it's just like these people going through all of this stuff. And so it's just this long, and it's a similar thing. Like it's, it's because it's out of context, but it's also that weird internet space, right? That, that if you collect this weird disembodied, even though it's a Zoom, it, it can become quickly disembodied. And then you put it all together and all of a sudden it, it creates these weird meanings that are not intended. But exactly like in grad school, like if you, if, 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 you know, if we get, go down to the 7-Eleven and we're talking grad school talk or, you know, stuff like that outside of 7-Eleven, people are going to be like, this sounds really stupid. You know, <laughs> like it sounds terrible. <laughs> like all these out of context things are just really, it's really interesting. I, and I'll I, say it. I've been having a ton of fun with that this year, and you're absolutely right. Like, I, you know, I can't, ima I can't imagine how many times, like, my parents mocked me after I left because I was talking about some grad school thing. They were like, ha, 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 hegemony. <laughs> like, uh, but uh, but I, 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 I got a piece into McSweeney's. Uh, so, like, my previous institution, who I have a great deal of hate for, uh, but, uh, like not just like uh, you know I don't like them like just actual like burning passionate hate uh, I, 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 to go back to the earnestness I am earnest about hating them uh, 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 one of my uh, colleagues who's still there who's a good friend uh, uh, she went the rest of us had been fired and she kept sending uh, sending us like screenshots from this uh, this meeting and that became online uh, uh, faculty message thread uh, meeting villanelle or whatever it was that went into McSweeney's. Uh, and I was delighted to, first of all, crack the McSweeney's nut, but also like with a villanelle, because I was like, this is perfect because the villanelle has no narrative potential. It always regresses on itself. Like you can't get out of it. And that's exactly what every fucking online meeting feels like. And it was, it's just like, I, I, it's one of those rare ones where I was like the form captures the content perfectly. <laughs> I'm sure we've all been on some Zoom meetings lately. <laughs> Eric, how are you and uh, Heather doing? I think uh, we we could probably do uh, maybe one one or two more questions, and then we should probably, uh, or I should at least stop recording. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, Jamie, Jamie, asked Jamie how go Matt ahead. And Heather, or, yeah. Oh, I was just asking how Eric and, and Heather are doing. We're we're good. Yeah, we're, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, sorry, our connection is aside from the night face. Our connection is not great, so we figured we wouldn't tax it but it's so wonderful to see all of your faces. 
Yeah, absolutely. So wonderful to hear from you guys. Yeah. Wait, I want to stop recording and then you can say whatever you want. <laughs>